in uh, where you are, G, in, uh, in Australia. Um, welcome to a new edition of Right Aligned with, um, with Ari. You're not studio anymore, is it? It's just Ari, isn't it? That's all you... Just Re. Just Re, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you guys are based in Sydney. Well, we'll just start to let people in. Uh, G, if it's possible for you just to lead us back to, well, as far back as you want to, really, just to whether it's education or the first stages, um, uh, colleges, university, all these sorts of things, just to paint us a bit of a picture about... Uh, you know the early days of your life in, in creativity and what really sparked you know a, a love for it and, and a desire to go into it as a career yeah sure um yeah funny because um you know when i think about my entry into the industry it's it's a bit of a convoluted story so um back in school english english language english literature were really the um the subjects that I enjoyed the most, the ability to kind of just use language and words um, to, yes, tell a story, but also just to explain something, to communicate to people. Um, and so the, the, there'd always been this element of communication that was something that I was really interested in, um, but never really knew that design or branding was something that you could do. And it was only much later on, like after uni, that I even became aware of what this thing branding was was all about. And it was off the back of this documentary that I saw on the BBC, which was about um, uh, a business on Savile Row called Norton and Sons. And the whole documentary was just about um, businesses that, that, that did tailoring. Uh, and there was, a, there was a branding agency, Moving Brands it was called, um, and it's still going even to this day. And it was just a, a little snippet into what this agency was doing to rebrand Norton and Sons uh, was, you know, came very close to, to going under. And then a chap called, I think his name is Patrick Grant, um, put some money into it and had, you know, engaged this agency to, to give it a, a fresh look of paint and to, to make it stand for something. Um, and yeah, watching that snippet in that documentary almost kind of just opened my eyes to branding and understanding that a business can have meaning um, and you can symbolize that meaning through design and how, you know, the power of design can be used in various different assets um, and in different places and spaces and to, to, to communicate. Um, and so, you know, it, it, off the back of watching that and being inspired by that, it was really just a case of, okay, so how do I, how do I break in? Um, and then it was a very, very long kind of journey into figuring out, was it design that I wanted to do? Was it strategy that I wanted to do? Was it writing that I wanted to do? Um, and through a, a, a process of um, banging on a lot of doors and doing all sorts of jobs, um, varying from being you know, an in-house designer, a publishing company, to um, being a, a, a researcher for a, a market research and innovation agency, to then eventually landing a gig as a strategist here in Sydney. Um, yeah, it was a it was a it was a, a warped and convoluted and twisted journey, but uh, I got there in the end. So um, and and here I am. Yeah. So did you do design at university? You didn't have a formal design education, so to speak. Just no, no. So I was yeah, I was I was self taught, and you know, not to kind of incriminate myself, but I had um, um you know. This was back in the days like Quark Express and Adobe CS2, and I managed to get hold of a, a, a you know copies of those. I won't tell you how, but um, you can probably guess. But anyway, yeah, just just through like sheer interest and curiosity, just teaching myself like how do I recreate a logo or how do I recreate something that I've seen that I like, and through a lot of kind of trial and error and very very painstaking. I mean, YouTube I think was around at the time, not to kind of reveal my age, but you didn't have the tutorials that you have today that you could just watch step by step someone doing something. Um, so yeah, so started off just as a self-taught designer, managed to land a gig as an in-house designer. Um, you'll know, you'll, you'll learn this more about, you know, my career. So I've pretty much just been faking it all the way through. So, uh, so um, even, even now what I'm doing as practice director at RE, I'm, I'm pretty much faking it as I go along. So, um, so yeah, that, that's always been a part of, of, me and my background and, and what I've done, but in terms of formal training as a designer, um, I didn't have it in a in your typical design school or or at uni or anything like that. Yeah, uh, well, there's two things I think that everybody I've spoken to has in common. They're winging it, and everybody had a fake copy or a dodgy copy of uh, of Quark or some sort of form of software. Uh, that's what ties us all together. 
Um, just going. A friend, a friend lent it to me. Yeah, so that's my line. Yeah, um, yeah, and he lent it to about three thousand other people as well. Um, going back, right back to more of your background, uh, G. Just before we move on to more about the creative side, was creativity ever uh, uh, accessible to you? Is it, you know, is it something that was not part of day to day life? You know, from from a family background or just your community? It was. Was it something a bit more of a privileged thing? Um. Yeah, interesting. I think I think innately I'd always loved design. So I, I recall even as a kid, I would often design cars. I would design houses. I loved I loved like buildings and architecture. Um, even this crazy thing, like I, I used to design mini disc players, right? At, at a certain point as well. It's just like I had this thing with like mini disc players and what could a, a new Sony mini disc player look like and what would be the features on it and, and all this kind of random stuff. So so products. Um, tangible things that you can hold and see, things that you would use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I would be drawing and sketching. Um, uh, what, why I was doing it, I'm not entirely sure, but I guess it was just more, I was fascinated by the visual. Um, I was interested in, you know, whilst I didn't know it at the time, but creativity and the power of design and what it can do. Um, and I just had a, a real kind of eye for things that were aesthetically pleasing at least to me like how do I how do I replicate that what are the rules that have been applied to make something look good um and and how does something over here look good versus something over here look bad and what are the things that make something good and bad yeah. in that respect but um in terms of like family life there was, there was no real kind of designers in my in in my family or in you know in as part of my upbringing um and you know like having parents that are um Ghanaian and Jamaican um design wasn't really something that we you know that was really even kind of suggested or spoken about as a potential career or anything like that it was um you you will go to uni and you will do a business degree of some sort and you will do something along those lines and, and that's what I did at uni I did a business degree because I didn't know what I was going to do so yeah no I, I asked I that because fell into it I find, I find that really fascinating because I think most creative people it's always subconsciously there whether you are pushed into it or whether you're exposed to it and you know there's always something subconsciously there an appreciation for for you know for creativity in some sort of form so it's it go, it just it just follows that lineage really that you know you were, you were doing things creatively even though it's probably not something that you necessarily thought would go any further and going on to when you took that in-house role how did that come about so if you've done business at, at uni you're interested in english and, and language and literature no real sort of clear path towards design how did apart from seeing the, the BBC documentary is that what it was is that was that the trigger that said oh, I'm going to go and find a job in design and start you know, at the bottom or start somewhere yeah so, so this publishing company excuse me um it was um it was a the business was called Central Media um and you know publishing house that had like the likes of design week creative review um so I was surrounded on the different levels of the of the of the building these really interesting publications and that there were loads of others as well that I didn't really pay too much attention to but um I actually landed a gig there it was like my first job out of uni and it was as a um like business development and kind of media sales and that, that's what I was doing um and it was probably about six seven months into it I was like nah this is this is really not for me like like you know you, you try to land your first gig out of uni and you, you you're happy that you've got one and then you're you start to realize this isn't really my cup of tea. Um, and there was, a, um, there was a production and design team that sat on our floor as well. And they had all like the big G5 Max and, um, you know, the big screens and, you know, it was all, and I, I'd always kind of walk past and we'd be, we'd be talking to each other and, you know, all part of the same team and just looking at, you know, what they were doing. Um, and so effectively, I just said, look, guys, I, I want to leave. This isn't really for me. Um, thank you very much but sayonara and um you know they were like well in actual fact we're happy for you to stay but like we want to keep you but what do you want to do and I was like well I want to do something in design I want to be creative but it's not it's not selling sponsorship and, and media sales it's um I just want to try and find something more creative so they gave me um a couple of weeks so there was a space coming up uh, as like a production assistant um because uh, one of the girls was leaving and so they said look do you want to try it for a little bit and I was like yeah 100% so I stayed on tried it for a bit and um 
yeah, that's that's when I got access to Quark Express and the Adobe Creative Suite. And literally I would just be just teaching myself, like, what do these tools do? How do you do this? What, what are layers? Um, why can't I get it to snap to grid? What's a grid? All of this stuff, right? Um, just really just kind of teaching myself and cut a very long story short, I ended up, you know, leaving that place as one of the lead designers working on publications and events um, material and uh, redesigns of the publications and things like that. So very much faking it, no formal training and learning on the job. But I guess it's one of those things that when you find something that you're really passionate about and something that interests you and something that just kind of the lights go off in your brain, it's not really work and you're, you're prepared to kind of try and, and, and test and, and work even beyond um, your normal nine to five hours. And, and that was it. And I spent a, a few years there doing that um, until inevitably I got bored. <laughs> so you, then um, you found yourself in Australia. How did that come about? What was that? Was there a trigger in, in that deciding to go? Was there an opportunity came up? Was it just wanted to change the scenery? Was it feeling like there wasn't the opportunities in the UK to, to break through? Yeah, um, more on a personal note, really. I think uh, my wife, well, my wife is Australian um, and we had our first son. He was probably about uh, two, maybe two or three when we decided that we would we would head out. And we always thought we always thought, you know, oh, we'd, we'd want to have at least one more um, and just kind of weighing up like we've got the option to move to to Australia, to Sydney, or do we want to kind of stay here or uh, stay there in the UK? And we kind of just collectively, uh, to be honest, I, I, I probably pushed for it more so than my wife did, um, pull together a bit of a keynote presentation and try to sell it to her. Um, but yeah, we, we, we said, uh, well, let's at least, you know, give it a shot for a couple of years. If we, if we like it, we'll stay. If not, um, we can always come back. Um, and lo and behold, we've been here now for a little over five years. Um, and no real kind of desire to go back to the UK just yet. So, um, so yeah, that, that was that was the reason. And, and there was no real kind of job uh, offer on the table. But in true strategist form, I'd, you know, did the did my homework, did a, a lay of the land, and, and knew all the agencies who had worked where. Um, reached out to people before we got there. So that when when we did land, I was almost kind of ready to have those conversations and be like, I am your next strategist, whether you know it or not, um, let's talk. And, and that's pretty much how I, I landed a few interviews and, and landed the gig at, at RE. So was your natural curiosity, do you think that led you to be going to strategy? So you were in, in, in all intents and purposes, you could have just stayed in design, couldn't you learn in quiet, find that in-house role, um, you know, sort of trying to find your feet as a self-taught creative. Was that just like a, an idea that I want to experience all different parts of this industry? Or was it just creative design, the day-to-day -day design? Maybe that just wasn't for you. I think I think um, I love brand and I love branding. And, you know, I would I would really kind of um, pay particular attention to, to studios that I admire and the, the quality of craft and, and the work and the thought that had gone behind, you know, making something become real and bringing that to life and not just bringing that to life on one touch point, but across, you know, a breadth of um, kind of assets and touch points and experiences. And to be honest, Chris, like I, I just, I think, I, I think I was always kind of, I always felt like I was chasing my tail. So, you know, you, you think about students that have gone to design school that they're exposed to creativity very early on. They've got a, a number of teachers who are, teaching them very early on in their careers about how to look at a problem, how to think about something and those techniques and, um, you know, those tips and tricks. And I, and I felt like I was always, I was always behind in that respect. And I think I just kind of looked at the work that I really wanted to do and, and felt I love creativity and I'm really interested and fascinated in brand. I don't think I'm good enough really. And I don't think I ever will be good enough of just being really honest with myself to be able to create something like that. And I think there was also another part of me that that just felt like there's a role to play in brand that isn't just design. And so it's very much about what is the thinking that goes behind the creativity? What is the thought process? What are the challenges that the business is trying to overcome? Um, 
effectively what's the strategy and I, I think there was always an analytical part to my brain and strategies felt like the, the perfect mix where you could bring that analytical side but really blend it into creativity um, and so I, I really just kind of focused on I can still be in this world still be in this industry um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be as a designer and I think also in addition I just in my previous experience it, it, it always felt that design was very very subjective and maybe it was just me and, and my lack of ability but I always felt that I was just trying to make something that other people liked versus strategy I felt that I could persuade people to believe in something or to see something in a certain way and so I, I steered towards strategy. Mm. Yeah, that, that idea of you saying there that you may not be able to compete was that more of a self-doubt issue or a, a personal thing or was that just just being deadly honest that you just thought that you you because people have gone through maybe a bit more of a, the, the, the system so to speak you know through like they say through university or college or learning the technicalities compared to some of that self-taught because I can I speak uh, generally about that I'm self-taught too and you know I sometimes I have those issues but I, I do also think every now and then I think actually I can compete this is just me putting myself you know this imposter sort of type thing this self-doubt mm. all these sorts of these uh, syndromes do you think that, that any of those have applied to you in, in the past or you know that's all it was valid I think it was valid I don't, I don't think um I think it's always important to try and stay humble but I think it's also really important to where possible as, as far as it is possible to be self-aware and I just I just knew that um I, I I just knew that I could go further as a strategist and have greater impact just in terms of my strengths and my capabilities and the way that my brain works than I could as a designer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, time and time again, even to this day, I look at the, I look at the designers within our business, even in our studio, and it just reinforces to me that I made the right decision. And that, that's not any kind of self doubt in my capability. It's more just self-aware that I, I genuinely believe that I'm better suited to strategy than I am as a designer and as I said before when I look at the designers around me it only reinforces that like their creativity even in our team in our Sydney studio and the designers that we've got in Melbourne their creativity is is through the roof like you just you the ideas that they come up with the way in which they can take strategy and, and bring that to life that's that's I could never I could never reach those levels and I wanted I wanted to be at a caliber of agency like the one that I'm at at the minute mm. and I don't think as a designer I, I could have I could have got there yeah was that a hard decision at the time is that was that just quite straightforward you know to sort of think you know after teaching yourself and going through that the, you know the sort of entering the industry maybe at a, a slightly later date than maybe other people that might just come straight from university was that difficult to then sort of think you turn your back on that or was it just common sense at the time it just made it just all fell into place and you thought this is the right thing to do I think it was I think it just felt right it was it was the common sense thing to do um and you know having said that like not to not to be Miles Davis and blow my own trumpet but I like to make strategy decks look good so yeah. I can still bring that creativity to a certain extent to to, to um to, to a degree um uh, I'm not a believer in dense text heavy strategy decks that's not really um my forte and, and nor do I think it, it should be for, for what we do um but I, I just feel that there are other ways in which you can bring creativity into the the role as a strategist um without necessarily having to strictly be a designer and and, and yeah it's it's worked for me up until this day yeah I love the idea of being Miles Davis of Davis strategy that's a that's a, that's a great uh, analogy that's um, a brilliant a brilliant thought for the uh, for the mind just for anybody that's tuning in that's maybe unsure of what strategy is you know like we hear about it it was never i don't think it existed when i first started i think we just did all these different things and we just burnt ourselves out just doing a million and one tasks what what does sort of strategy involve and what do you need to to, to be a strategist um what do you need to be a strategist you need to have a, a curious mind um strategy is very much about like not taking things on face value um being able to uh, you know look at a problem look at a business problem a business challenge um and you know actually we've been doing these sessions this week and within the business talking through various components of strategy 
Um, and, and the thing that always comes to my mind is, you know, yes, we, we talk about problem solving, but sometimes it's about looking for the problems that need to be solved because the client may not necessarily know it or see it. So it's having a, a, an inquisitive mind, a really curious um, kind of mindset and approach to, to, to problem solving and being able to connect the dots between sometimes very random things. Um, but you can find a really interesting thread that, that, that ties all of these different ideas and thoughts together um, to, to come to a solution. Um, and effectively, it's not just about the problem solving component, but it's also very much about being able to persuade people, sometimes a large organization of people from different teams looking at the same challenge from their perspective. It's about persuading them that actually collectively we need to look at it like this and we need to address it in this way. Um, so, so, so strategy for me is very much there's the, the, the analytical component to it, but then there's also the, the what you might class as the more poetic element, the, the storytelling, uh, which ties everything together to, to make people think and feel, yeah, that's the right way that our business and our brand should go. Yeah, and then you feed that into the creative team who, who take that those thoughts and ideas and that, that foundation and sort of elaborate on that. Is that how it roughly works? Yeah, and I, I, I think it, in a traditional agency, that's how it would work in the sense that you would have your strategy department um, working on something, maybe in isolation, and then throw in the strategy brief or the, the creative brief and the strategy document over to the creatives for them to try and make sense of it. I think more and more and more what we're seeing and experiencing is that um, that's just a, a, an old fashioned way of doing it. And I think as, as far as it's possible, if you can bring teams, different disciplines together, um, you know, I often talk about um, having creatives that think like strategists and strategists that can understand creatives um, and having those teams come together very early on just means that you know I, I could have um you know a, a junior designer come up with a great positioning um for a, for a business that we're working on or you know a great value proposition based on their experience of using the product um or a, you know a really really kind of quirky out of the box like unexpected personality could come not from a copywriter could come from you know a motion designer um and then you start to think about how you know, movement and motion can bring that personality to life. So I think um, very much it's a case of getting those different disciplines together early on. Uh, and whilst the strategist will lead the development of the strategy, doesn't necessarily mean that they are the ones who have to crack it and solve it all by themselves. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It really, um, it's sort of blurring the lines in a nice way, isn't it? It's given people, you know, cross uh, the ability to cross over sections and sort of be part of the bigger sort of story. And that's, I think, we've heard in the past of, how people have felt isolated in bigger teams because they just yeah. don't see the client or they don't get to be part of strategy or, or you know, even the creative, they just start working or whatever it might be. So that's nice to see. So moving on to, on to Regi, can you sort of give us a sort of a bit of a synopsis of the philosophy of what the studio is all about and the business sort of stands for? Yeah, totally. Um, since I've joined, the business has gone through an evolution of um, how it approaches the work that it does and, and the, the types of clients that it works with. Um, you know, I, I think if we were to talk about, you know, the philosophy of the studio, of the business, um, you know, at, at its core, it's, it's very much about connection, right? So we talk a lot about we design to connect. And effectively what we mean when we say that is that um, everything within an organization and a business um, should be connected and you can see examples of businesses and brands that fall down when those connections are really, really loose or don't exist at all. Um, and, and when we talk about connections, effectively what we mean is, you know, you can have a CEO of a business talk very passionately about their vision, um, but you go on shop floor and the, the, the workers on shop floor have no idea what that vision is about. They've never heard of it. You know, they're, they're just there trying to push sales um, or even within an organization at a closer level, you know, marketing teams, not talking to product teams, not talking to sales teams, you know, all of these disparate teams, all of their own separate team KPIs and not aligning to one single vision. Um, you can see that, that, that disconnect. Um, and so when we talk about design to connect, it's about, you know, everything from C-suite to shop floor. How can you use design to tie that thread so that there is 
an element of synergy, um, a common understanding what that business is about, the experiences that it wants to create for its customers uh, and making sure that, you know, um, the customers can relate to that vision. They understand it if they, if they indeed care about it, but it's very much reflected in their day-to-day experiences of that brand. Um, so that's our philosophy. And, and, and what that philosophy and approach has done for us as a business has unlocked so many different types of briefs and so many different types of challenges. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating almost to kind of look at the intray of, you know, requests that we get um, vary from, you know, we've got 200 odd websites um, under our umbrella through a process of, you know, just confusion over years. Can you help us consolidate um, all of that, all of that information, all that data, what's the, and also which one, you know, which of those websites do we keep and what's the, the value and the utility of each of those websites and how does that connect to our master brand? So that could be one example. Uh, another one being, you know, we're having trouble um, attracting the right type of talent. Can you help us with our employer brand? It's like, yeah, absolutely. Cause that's definitely connected to your vision. It's definitely connected to the product and the quality of the service that you deliver. And, you know, how do you tie all of those things together? So, so the, 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 the very, uh, the, the, there's a, a varied type of brief that comes through our door. Um, which means that we're using different parts of our brain and do, using different skill sets all of the time. That must be really refreshing, isn't it? So instead of like maybe getting numerous branding exercises or you know um, surface level sort of stuff for startups or you know, entrepreneurial sort of things, having things like that, 200 website would say like, to a lot of people, myself included, sounds like just a massive headache. But I suppose the way that you guys are, are approaching it, I suppose you can use that that sort of the idea that model that you might use for a brand you could use that for something as complicated and as internal as just the structure of websites and then sort of delivering a much more streamlined and efficient system yeah and i think i think it it really just boils down to to the why like what is the what is the purpose of of this like what 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 do you want the end user to do and i think what, what we often find is businesses through a process of um you know acquisition or just the the development of a new service to go, oh, that needs a new website, that needs another URL. Um, and so, you know, this, this concept of design to connect is very much about, well, what is the utility and the value of this? And how does that connect to what you stand for? Um, and, you know, if it's, if it's students or if it's employees or if it's um, customers, um, what is the journey? What is the experience for them? Um, and how does that connect to the overarching thing that you're trying to sell, that value proposition? Why should I choose you? Why should I buy you? So by, by asking really pointed questions and, and almost kind of being um, very kind of militant with, with what should stay and what shouldn't and, and how they, all of those connections are, are work together, you can really get to something that, that A, has real value and meaning, but also it's... Um, it just it it just makes things simpler and better and i think there's so much noise going on in the world today and so much that's in forms of distractions um businesses are really looking for clarity and so our, our philosophy of design to connect brings clarity to businesses where they're like that's our unified story and this is what we stand for now we can go forth and and, and grow and expand or or or, or, or venture into new spaces. So whatever it is that they want to do, we're, what we're finding is that approach and that philosophy of design to connect is really, really powerful. Yeah, and we were talking just before we started today and when we first connected a while ago about this, the work that you're doing towards pushing the, the, the boundaries of, of branding and design in terms of not just having this sort of set stance you know, you've got the traditional formats of having a logo and an asset and a colour palette and X, Y, Z. It's sort of like looking to maybe redefine it in some sort of way, in your own way. Is that, is that come about a very conscious decision from the, from the business perspective or was that an organic thing as you've grown, you know, in recent times? Um, I think, I think Re has always, um, has always built really kind of, long starting relationships with with its clients um so you know like the, i think you know the business re started off in in sydney australia um and and for you know for all the time that i've been at re um optus which is one of the the, the telcos here in, in australia has always been our client as is um one of we've got like 
four big banks here in Australia, and one of them is Commonwealth Bank, CBA, um, has, has for a long time been one of our clients. And I think, I think certainly the way in which we approach the work that we do, um, and that's not to say that it's necessarily unique to us, but I think the way in which we do approach our work is there's so much more to design than just your rebrand. And I think sometimes in our industry, we, we create this um, almost this kind of sugar hit rush where big rebrand, massive case study, um, put it out on all the socials and, you know, and then move on to the next. But design is, is an ongoing iterative process, right? And not every business wants to rebrand or nor should every business rebrand, but that doesn't mean there isn't a role to play for design. And so what we're finding is, is that um, more and more businesses are coming to us and even businesses that have had a rebrand, not even with us, with another agency, and they've gone, can you take a look at this for us? I was like, yeah, absolutely, of course we can. Mm. Um, and, and, and so I think you know, what we find ourselves in, in our position is, yes, we, we do the, the big rebrands uh, or, or the big refreshes, and we case study those and we, we, we talk about those, there's so much work that, that goes literally unseen um, that is very much, you know, not necessarily the, the, the big expose and the big kind of reveal, but you will feel it as a customer. Like something has changed in the experience, that customer journey, um, something has changed. There's a, there's, a different, there's a different feel about this product or this service and I can't quite put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. And you can bet your bottom dollar it's been designed. Um, and so that's, that's really kind of, pushing our designers and our, our copywriters and our strategists into different spaces and, and, and thinking differently about the role that design can play for an organization and their customers. Do you find that hard to get that across to customers or potential clients? The idea that it's not always just visual because you know, I think tradition sort of has pointed that way, hasn't it? Design has, has traditionally been a visual asset. That, you know, the, the idea of a rebrand and a launching it on all the you know, creative media sites, newspapers, magazines, as well as general social media. It's like a big, it is a big sugar rush, isn't it? It's a big ego hit for the designers as well as the clients. Um, and then you, you don't ever hear of those businesses ever again because nobody ever reports on the, you know, the service that they give or the way that their internal operations work because they're not, is interesting are they're exciting so the idea that you, as a creative studio you can infiltrate just the, the way that they operate on a day-to-day -day, on a level the way that they sort of you know, manage teams whether that's sort of from giving them um, care you know well-being sort of services or, or whether that's just giving a better service to customers that they've already had and not this um, eternal push just to offer the best to new clients is that something that's difficult to maybe or is that just the way that you communicate it and the way that you um, you know, the way that you sell yourself to potential clients is that you know is that I think more than anything what I'm trying to understand is how do you get clients that are that are interested in things away from the traditional sort of visual you know beautiful side of design yeah that, that's a really good question I think there's there's probably maybe at least two ways around that I think the first thing is um we've got a very simple story that we tell when we talk about ourselves I mean, we talk about design to connect we talk about how Design to Connect is, you know, building connections between colleagues, customers, and culture, right? So straight away that takes you everywhere. It's not just about the brand that your customers will see, but it's also about your colleagues, right? What does the brand mean for, for, for people that work for you? Um, what does that brand mean when you're uh, attracting new talent? And how do you keep that talent once they're through the doors? And then we talk broadly speaking about culture. Now, culture is one of those massive words, right? But I think when you're talking about culture, you're talking about um, behavior at, at a societal level. What are the things that, how can communication change behavior? How can design change behavior? Um, how do you change the way people think about something? So, so that already opens up the door to, you're not just about logos and identity systems and you know, uh, motion principles and things like that. The, the second thing as well, I think is, because the, the, the philosophy, if you want to call it that, of design to connect is so beautifully simple and yet so powerful, what we really try to focus on is how can the client, however small or however big the brief is, how can they start to experience that and taste that? And so a lot of our work is we get asked to do something. We show them the process. We show them how we uh, approach design and brand. 
And it starts to trigger ideas in their mind as to what else we could help them with. So, you know, I, I think of an example of, um, of Domain, which is like a, a property tech business here in Australia. They came to us with a very, very simple brief, like help us reposition who we are. And also, can you just tidy up our, our identity system, right? That they didn't really have much of a brand identity system to begin with. Oh, and by the way, we've got a, a campaign, um, you know, seasonal campaign that, that perhaps you could help us with. So that was the initial brief. And this was probably about um, what we in now, 2022, about two years ago. And through the journey of like doing that, we've had so many other briefs come through. So, you know, brand architecture, looking at the whole group, how do these clusters of businesses work together? How do we help that business kind of unify everything that they're creating to create a new category, right? Um, we, we, we created a brand strategy for them that really kind of unified them as a business about this is what we're about. This is what Australians need in the property space. And this is why we're the right people to deliver that. And that's extended through certain divisions of the business wanting to wanting help with what's their story and how does it ladder up to the, the bigger master brand story. Right through to recently, just last year, end of last year, we, we developed their employer brand. And so so that, that initial brief, um, their experience of understanding what the concept of design to connect can mean for them as a business means that they typically just keep coming back for more, for more, for more. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, not to kind of, again, be Miles Davis and blow our own trumpet, but we're very, very um, mindful of this is an approach to design and brand that can unlock so many opportunities within an organization. Um, and it's not just about the rebrand. And so through our experience with our clients, what we're doing is almost by through osmosis, educating them that there's so much more to design than just a big rebrand. Mm. Now, I suppose in theory, by offering, by starting with the basics and offering the value in that respect, I suppose you be becoming the second sort of opening in-house team, can't you? You just become a partner as opposed to someone that just picks you up and drops you whenever they want. You know, you become you know, an essential part of their, you know, their operation on a day-to-day level. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 certainly the goal, and I think um, I think I think there's also a myth within our industry as well, right? That you know a, a business will have a, a a problem, a challenge, especially businesses at scale, and that the rebrand can be done through a, a contained period of time. Let's say a, a you know a few months, um, maybe maybe up to a year, and then that's it, job done. Um, and that's a myth that we're seeing more and more is just not the case. Um, And so, you know, yes, there could be the big rebrand, but then there's so many things that fall off the back of that, so many opportunities that fall off the back of that rebrand as to how to push it, how to keep it relevant and fresh. Um, You know, as they venture into new products and services, how do you apply that brand to that experience? Because it's not just as simple as grabbing that logo, making sure you've applied the right rules in the guideline and sticking it on. There's so many different ways in which those different formats and mediums mean that the brand needs to interact uh, and breathe and live and breathe in different and new interesting ways. So we're, we're seeing a continuous kind of runway of opportunities even long after uh, a, a massive rebrand. Yeah, I love that. It's like more and more, it feels just like little layers, doesn't it? It's like a daily exercise of just reinforcing what you sort of stand for. And I think when you come back to that, why isn't it? You always ask that internally, but then the way that you communicate that is so essential. You know, it's easy for to create the best brand in the world if you give it to somebody that's just then going to deface it or do not, nothing with it you know, of, of, of worth, then it's completely pointless, isn't it? It just has no, uh, yeah. there's no need for it. Just, just conscious of the time, Jim, just in, really interested in the sort of where you're at in, in, in Australia and the sort of landscape of design in, in the country and, and well, in the whole of the region, really, with you know, the Southern Hemisphere, compared to, you know, what we're what we're in the UK and, and Europe and, and America. Is there a what's the what's the sort of structure like? Is it a real sort of energetic sort of uh, industry at the minute? Is it is it sort of is it a completely different landscape to what we're experiencing here because of you know, because of maybe when we first spoke, you sort of saying that it's like say two or three banks, for instance, as opposed mm-hmm. to God knows how many we've got here, you know, and it's sort of just a, a very much a shouting match. Is there, is that that sort of marketplace, is it really sort of starting to change because of design? Is it really sort of vibrant and exciting or is there still a long way, do you think, for it to go, you know, for, for more people to come into the market? 
Yeah, I think I think it's a really um, vibrant market at the minute. I think you know um, we're in a relatively privileged position with our business here in Australia that we've got some you know some of the country arguably some of the country and region's biggest um, businesses that we work with. Um, but putting those big businesses to one side, I think if you're looking at perhaps what you might class smaller businesses, middle scale, but mid tier businesses, um, and even startups and scale ups, um, there is a booming market um, in, in the APAC region. Um, one that's, we, we've only merely scratched the surface really. Um, and I think, you know, in particular for myself. So I've actually transitioned in the last kind of few months from strategy role into uh, practice role. Uh, and, and my specific focus is on scale ups, right? So looking at how we do what we do, but for businesses, high growth businesses that are looking to scale um, at speed. Um, and, and, that's, and that's entering into to, to, you know, global markets around the world. And I think there's a real, there's a real energy in the startup and scale up space at the minute. Like we're seeing ridiculous amounts of money being thrown at businesses at, at various funding uh, levels. Um, and that's in Australia, that's in New Zealand. Um, but I think, I think the biggest thing for us is that we're, whilst we started here and our, the roots will always be in Sydney, that's where Pat, the, the founder and CEO um, started the business. Um, it's less about, you know, and we, we might focus on a particular region. It's, it's more that global outlook. Um, so, you know, just the other day we were chatting with the team in London um, for a US kind of bank opportunity that we are all kind of involved in at, you know, various hours of the day <laughs> uh, with, the, with the time zones. Um, just the other, just, just the tail end of last year, we, we worked on a, an ed tech business um, in North America. Um, and again, connecting all of our teams uh, around the globe to, to collectively work on that. So I think, yes, whilst we are actually situated here in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and we've got a, a particular focus on clients that are here, more and more what we're doing is actually collectively working as a global unit at what those opportunities are so that we can keep working around the clock um, to, 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 to deliver that, that, that kind of concept and that philosophy of design to connect. Now, is that the long-term future of the agency then you think is that this idea of much more of a global uh, it's not really where you're based you know, because of the benefit of you know i think covid has really sort of has reinforced that uh, virtual loop, uh, work sort of balance isn't it where you can connect with people all over quite easily um, is that something that you think the agency will eventually become is that is it it's much more of a around the clock sort of business that as it takes inspiration from different cultures of the teams wherever they are in different territories but also allow us to it can also not in the sense i don't mean 24 hours in the sense that it works out to the bone for quite a bit you've got a, a much more of a, a you know a, a full circle approach because you've got people in different territories and, and time zones well yeah i mean i, I don't I, I i would even go so far as to say it's, it's not something that we're working towards it's something that we are um so you know um the, the, the very nature of the business now and, and, you know, can't really talk about it too much right now, but there will be mo more growth this year that, that, that we'll be able to talk about in the coming months um, with, you know, presence in, 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 in other parts of the world. So I think um, it's, it's, it very much is who we are at the minute and it's the way that we operate. And I think more and more, if, if COVID has done anything, it's, it's demonstrated more and more to us that, you know, it doesn't almost really matter where you are, um, as long as you've got fiber or broadband MBN of some sort uh, and a screen, um, you can communicate with anyone and everyone um, at, at all times of the day, whether you like it or not. As this is proven, I agree. this is, a, this is a prime, prime example. And on that note, I think it's a good time to leave it because I appreciate your, uh, it's an, an end of another busy day, I'm sure, with the boys in bed and, uh, and, and uh, another day looming large. So I'll let you uh, get off and uh, get some rest, G. I appreciate your time. I um, hope you have a, a great, um, well, it'll be Thursday, won't it, by the time, uh, by the time we get out to it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll catch up again soon, but I really, really appreciate your time. I hope everybody's enjoyed that. It's great to get a bit more insight into, into yourself and the agency. I look forward to tracking the, tracking the future and seeing where you go. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Chris. Always okay. good to speak to you, mate.